Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to what we hope will be the very first NavyCon, an event to discuss how navies of the future have been portrayed in science fiction and relevance to our Navy and Marine Corps of today. It's about navies of past, present, and future. And I'd especially like to welcome a couple of groups that we know are following live. Uh, first is the Royal Manticorn Navy. Thank you very much for what you did in supporting this event. And also Texas A&M's History Department. We hope we meet your expectations and we look forward to the uh, post-event discussion that you'll be having there. I'm Claude Barabee. I'm the director of the Naval Academy Museum. Now in Star Trek First Contact, Data tells the Borg Queen, believing oneself to be perfect is often the sign of a delusional mind. In that vein, there may be technical glitches or something <laughs> that may not meet your expectations today at NavyCon. And in the case of any unintentional errors today, ladies and gentlemen, blame me. Can I have the next slide? Sorry. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is my Twitter account. This is my email address. If anything goes wrong, my responsibility, not anybody else's. Everything that goes right today, however, is on our great tech staff and presenters, and I'd like to thank them all for taking this time today to share their thoughts. All of the presenter bios, by the way, are on the Naval Academy Museum website. If you go to usna.edu backslash museum, scroll down to NavyCon, you'll see all the bios there for you. This, this uh, will enable me to keep the bio, sorry, the uh, presentations uh, and the introduction short so that we have the maximum amount of time with our presenters. This event's hashtag is NavyCon, so please keep the conversation going. Now, there is a tradition in the military. Oh, I've got to chase, thanks. Got it. Yep. There's a tradition in the military about challenge coins. Uh, some of you may have received them in your careers. Uh, so for this event, this museum's boat model shop made a special run of 50. On the back, we have the names of our guest speakers, like a NASA mission patch, and the names are Heyer, Gallagher, Weber. So on the front is the USS Constitution, because the wood is actually from the Constitution. And for those of you who are a little worried that I've pulled wood off the Constitution, <laughs> uh, don't worry about it. This is waste wood, because keep in mind, she just came out of dry dock, and so we were able, as uh, one of the Navy museums, to get some wood for special events like this. So I'll be giving a challenge coin to each of the presenters, and we'll have some for the folks who were able to join us here uh, as attendees. Each presenter will have 15 to 20 minutes, after which we'll have time for a few questions. And I will be following on Twitter, so if you all have uh, any questions, I'm going to try to take as many as I can from our viewers out there. Now, we're honored that we have such a variety of individuals and experiences presenting their thoughts on their favorite aspects of reality and fiction. Our presenters collectively reflect the Vulcan philosophy infinite diversity in infinite, con in infinite combinations. They are civilians and military, Navy, Army, and Marine, sorry, Air Force, <laughs> junior and senior, active duty, reservists, retired, those about to be recalled to active duty, theoreticians, analysts, and practitioners, science fiction writers, reporters, historians, and nonfiction authors, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, and Romulans, and those who have sailed on the seven seas and one who's been to the ocean of space. We hold this event at the Naval Academy Museum, which I think is appropriate since so much fiction has discussed a higher uh, learning institution. Whether it was Star Trek's Starfleet Academy or David Weber's Saganami Island, there is almost always that place where young men and women learn their trade. And always there are stories with all the conflicts that make those stories compelling. Who would watch a Star Trek series, These Are the Voyages of the Unmanned USS Enterprise, operated only by Richard Daystrom's M5 unit? It wouldn't go well for a lot of merchant ships out there. As in reality, not everything is ideal. Not everyone gets along. At Starfleet Academy, Midshipman Kirk had a nemesis in the upperclassman Finnegan. I'm certain that Captains Van Droff and Heyer and Commander Armstrong, however, never experienced the wrath of an upperclassman here at the Naval Academy. Starfleet Academy sends an interesting message about the fleet's higher education. 
Consider the case of John, Professor John Gill, a history professor with no canonical experiences outside of the classroom. He is assigned to the divided planet of Ecos. The professor that Kirk remembered as the kindest, gentlest man he ever knew tries to unite the, the Ecosians with a disastrous misapplication of history using the example of Nazi Germany. Book knowledge in Star Trek alone is insufficient, suggesting that instruction also requires a balance of real life experiences. And that may be why a young Lieutenant James T. Kirk as an instructor at the academy made such an impression on Gary Mitchell, who called him a stack of books with legs. The same is true here at the Naval Academy, which has an equal balance, roughly, of civilian and military instructors, including a lot of lieutenants. But an academy teaches more than what's in the books. And for that, Starfleet Academy has the man whom Picard called one of the wisest men I ever knew. Arguably, Boothby had more influence mentoring generations of naval officers by listening, watching, reflecting, quietly working, and subtly guiding. Boothby was, of course, the groundskeeper at Starfleet Academy, showing us that education isn't only through books or in the classroom. Now, Congressman Gallagher will tell you about Starship Troopers, written by Robert Heinlein, Naval Academy class of 1929. But I'd like to tell you a story, a sci-fi story, a real one, about another midshipman. Ned Beach, class of 1939 was one of those Americans who, who tuned in to a few minutes too late to the classic Orson Welles radio play, War of the Worlds. So convinced that the Martians were really attacking, he led midshipmen to the armory to break out weapons and defend Annapolis. <coughs> His company officer stopped him, then gave him demerits, not for storming the armory. He gave him demerits for having an unauthorized radio in his room. <laughs> Ned Beach turned out okay. He later commanded the first nuclear submarine to, to uh, circumnavigate the world submerged, the Triton, and wrote the novel Run Silent, Run Deep, later a movie with Clark Gable, while he served as the naval aide to President Eisenhower, one of our underachievers here. <coughs> but whether it was the Naval Academy or those in science fiction, academies were, were to be a place where midshipmen learned to be a part of something greater than themselves something that Senator McCain again repeated recently. Here we prepare for the future by understanding and appreciating where we've been, our history, our heritage, our tradition, and that is also reflected in the Star Trek universe. We are here in Preble Hall, the Naval Academy Museum. Walking through the two decks of exhibits, you'll actually see the same naval heritage valued in Star Trek. In Star Trek First Contact, the movie, the crew celebrates Worf's promotion to commander wearing period age of sail uniforms, including bicorns on their heads. Here, we, here at the museum, we have the bicorns of Lieutenant Charles Wilkes, who commanded the exploring expedition, uh, the bicorn of Commodore Matthew Perry, uh, Admiral Dewey, and others. To honor his former commanding officer, Lieutenant Geordie LaForge doesn't use the replicator to build a model of HMS Victory. He built it from scratch, like we do here. And here we have the largest collection of original British dockyard models on display. We even have a Napoleonic era, that's the lower right hand one, a Napoleonic era French POW bone model of the victory that took 15 prisoners of war two years to the day to build and actually rested on Nelson's tomb for a time. Picard clearly values the heritage of the name Enterprise as evidenced by the series of previous ships that bore its <coughs> name in his ready room. The same is true in Captain Jonathan Archer's quarters, which also has images of those ships. Likewise, our walls are covered by half hulls and models of ships that carried our predecessors into battle and exploration. So why do this? Why talk about this issue of navies in science fiction today? It's not unprecedented and it's not unserious. For example, the Marine Corps Warfighting Laboratory recently published an anthology of science fiction futures. It was supported by, I think, the Atlantic Council's, excuse me, the Atlantic Council's Art of the Futures Project fellows, including August Cole, co-author of Ghost Fleet. The stories explored in sci-fi discuss what might happen in the future and how we might plan for it. They're also lessons for today. Now, Lieutenant Matt Hipple will uh, cover a more recent issue that really was the genesis of this event today. 
Science fiction expands our minds and tries to envision or warn about the future. Some science fiction has already become reality. The science fiction of the past predicted rockets that would travel to the moon, or communicators that became the flip phones of the 1990s. Ships and navies in science fiction are compelling, but the technologies envisioned hold only a limited fascination. We are compelled because the characters in Firefly, The Expanse, Honorverse, Star Trek, Star Wars, Battlestar Galactica, and too many here to name, are at their essence human stories, our stories. They are words of inspiration in the heat of battle. The American Revolution's John Paul Jones, who said, I have not yet begun to fight, and whose crypt is just a few yards from us beneath the Naval Academy Chapel. The War of 1812's James Lawrence, whose dying words were, don't give up the ship, a flag that is the centerpiece of the first deck gallery here at the Naval Academy Museum, and his portrait hangs right on the other side of this wall. The Civil War's Admiral, uh, Civil War's Admiral David Farragut, who said, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, at the Battle of Mobile Bay is represented by the flag of it, the wheel of his flagship from the USS Hartford. And of course, there is Picard of the Enterprise, or at least an alternate universe of the Enterprise, which there seem to be a lot of. So <laughs> when we talk about past, present, and future today, we're really talking about past, future, past, present, future. Depends which Star Trek series you're talking about. So bear with us. Science fiction stories are of hope and failure and, of course, survival. They are largely the same stories of today's Navy and Marine Corps, the impact of sailors struggling to save their ship and each other, the leadership of some officers and some officers who fell short. The same argument in shipbuilding Jerry Hendricks might, might have made in his seminal article, Build, For Build Fords, Not Ferraris, could also be made in Star Trek during the Dominion War to build defiance, not galaxies. Sorry, Jerry. <laughs> now, if you've been confounded by the variety of Starfleet uniforms over the years, fear not. The Navy hasn't fared much better. <laughs> <laughs> and we won't get into the abomination created by Starfleet Command's Task Force uniform design. Or should we? <laughs> Arguably. There is always an over-reliance on expectations from computers susceptible to failure. Relying on a Navy database or email operating right, or taking the DOD Cyber Awareness <laughs> Challenge, <laughs> is sometimes as dangerous as walking into a flawed Star Trek holodeck. Fair warning to the DOD Cyber Awareness takers out there, never ever listen to Tina. <laughs> and of course, there is the balance between human and automated control of systems, the opportunities they offer, but also the threats, as evidenced by the Doomsday Machine, Nomad slash V'ger, we know it was the same story, or the Arsenal of Freedom. Despite all of these technical challenges, it is the human element that solves the riddle. It is the human element that finds a resolution, that defines the war. It is the human effort to volunteer to serve on boats and shuttles, and starships. It's the human decision making that builds and operates them. It's the human, that sailor or marine, who displays courage, excuse me, and soldiers, that one, who displays courage and ingenuity in battle. It is our humanity that makes the peace. It's how a naturally divided humanity can be united in a common cause, such as when Captain Janeway merges the crew of the Voyager and the Maquis and other races. It's the human propensity for challenge that will debate who the best Star Trek captain was. Ladies and gentlemen, argue, I argue it's not the perennial choice of Kirk or Picard. The real choice is between Cisco and Janeway. Internet just blew up at that last <laughs> I don't even want to look at the hashtag right now. 